Oh hi, I'm the heretic. To be honest, this has happened so many times I lost count if we're on the third adpocalypse or the fourth. But here we are nonetheless. Now before we start the video, make sure to share it with everyone you know. It's important that we get the word out about this problem as well as the solution. You see, there's a way to end this problem for all time. I'll tell you how we all can not only prevent censorship like this from occurring, but make it impossible through technological innovation and counter economics. But first, some context about the Adpocalypse 3.0. What happened is that the totalitarian space filler on the internet and BuzzFeed wannabe, Vox, decided to put their aristocratic superiority complexes on full display by going after political YouTube commentator Steven Crowder. In all fairness, there wasn't anything I could add that wouldn't make the well water any more toxic to begin with. Anyways, so what happened is that as part of his show, Crowder went after Vox host Carlos Mesa, roasting him for, among other facts, that he's a talentless hack and an authoritarian asshole being gay. <laughs> chip, 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 that you can eat just one. Like dicks. This is what Mr. Gay Vox wants to do. Mr. Lispy Queer from Vox. What, what, what were you holding, Gay Latino from Vox? <laughs> Even his hand movement and fast motion is gay. Now we're here with a short haired angry lesbian on Skype. And cable news, cable news bitching. Two gay guys sitting there eating a banana. We get the symbolism oh. there. Deciding he's had enough, Mr. Lisp Queer took this directly to YouTube staff, accusing Crowder of harassment for calling him things that he's called himself several times. YouTube's team promised to do an investigation, and what they determined was that although Crowder's videos were hurtful, the videos don't violate YouTube policy. Now, that should be the end of it, right? YouTube says the remarks are hurtful, but don't constitute a violation of policy. Well, no. YouTube demonetized much of Steven Crowder's YouTube channel, so he can't get ad revenue from his videos. Which is bad enough, as many YouTubers, including Crowder, rely on these ads as a revenue stream. Apparently, YouTube took offense to Crowder's Socialism is for Fags t-shirt. But apparently, this wasn't good enough for Mr. Mazza. No, he wanted his enemy destroyed, deplatformed, and his voice removed from the airwaves. Massa called upon the SJW mob to lean on Google, and it didn't work. The mob didn't work. Now YouTube has, since the Wall Street Journal originally went after PewDiePie by leaning on his advertisers directly, bent over backwards to screw over content creators, all to appease and assure advertisers that their content definitely will not appear on a Holocaust denial video. So it's actually a genuine surprise when they show something resembling a spine. Somewhat. Meanwhile, being silent about how pedophiles use their platform to communicate with each other while monetizing their videos. So according to YouTube, videos questioning the hundreds of inconsistencies related to the Parkland shooting, or even videos explaining how the Galactic Empire from Star Wars was economically doomed to fail, are all wrong and horrible. Kitty diddling is just fine and dandy. Shows where their priorities lie, doesn't it? Now make no mistake, this is censorship. Chasing content creators away from their platform, trying to control our behavior. While many content creators, myself included, are willing to do this for free, some simply cannot justify investing the time into creating quality content. As a result, their content suffers or disappears altogether. Consumers get less content, and viewers leave the platform, as it is no longer informative or entertaining. As YouTube's business model is to get as many eyeballs on screen as possible, well, the result of these adpocalypses are a consistent loss for everyone involved. Losses for the creators, the viewers, the advertisers, and YouTube. Even if you still use a platform, surely you've noticed how Marxist channels get promoted constantly, and when you look up news, the first search results are always mainstream media sources. You have to go to BitChute, Vimeo, or Daily Motion to find, you know, actual news from second stream and alternative sources instead of just status propaganda. 
This does not serve us. It does not serve you. The only organization that is helped by any of this is Google. The way they make money is they get subsidies from the government. And what the government wants is to get as many people participating in the political process as possible. Which is what makes things like social media censorship and YouTube censorship so useful because it drives people into the political process, coercing them into thinking the only way that they can get the content that they want without being censored is to go to the government that writes their terms of service to begin with. They don't make money off of you or advertisers. YouTube has never been profitable in the entirety of its existence. The way the government gets their back scratched is that Google manipulates their search results to favor certain government-friendly political agendas, such as Marxism. The extent to which they nuke their own business model is indicative of a greater agenda. To coerce you into believing status propaganda by tricking you into thinking you found it yourself. It doesn't matter to Google if they don't make money off of YouTube, as long as they make more statists, trick more people into the political process, and keep getting those chicken tendies from the government for being a good boy, then they're fine. But as I said, there's a solution. How to prevent this kind of stuff from happening? If it isn't stopped, we'll be right back here. Talking about the same stuff, pointing out YouTube's hypocrisy again in just a few months' time. Now, something which is being neglected by most mainstream or second stream coverage of this recent adpocalypse, because of course they always omit some vitally important bit of information that tends to be something which happens when such an obvious conflict of interest exists with the government writing your scripts, is that this is actually part of a well-organized and planned Marxist political strategy designed to silence opposition as showcased in the thread here called Beautiful Trouble, which is more or less a political strategy guide to be utilized in the same vein as Saul Alinsky's Rules for Radicals, but specifically intended to affect social trends and culture published originally back in 2012. I've known about Beautiful Trouble for a while. That tactic is a big part of why I encourage anarchists to reject any attempt made by statists to become political allies. But you also have to remember that these social media platforms explicitly favor these people in their algorithms with the intent to help them seem more influential and prominent than they actually are. Whether it's YouTube recommending Marxist content in their suggested videos tab a large percentage of the time on rather innocuous non-political videos, or Twitter promoting tweets from Marxist profiles. To the point where 85% of all tweets on Twitter which top the algorithms come from only 10% of the accounts. Right now, we are living in a time where in the United States and in most of Europe, the population is growing overwhelmingly distrustful and disfavorable in their views of the state, if not outright denouncing and showing skepticism towards the concept of political rule in general. In fact, in the United States, according to consumer trust polls, the United States government is the least trustworthy organization in the perspective of those polled by a significant significant margin. Right now, most people, because of the internet, are starting to realize two things. Firstly, that the government never functions for their financial or social interests, and secondly, that governments are fundamentally incapable of functioning in their financial and social interests, because governments fundamentally function and are intended to function in a zero-sum manner. That is, they gain influence over society and resources at the direct expense of non-state actors by using coercion to obtain these resources from them and to attempt to control the outlets which they associate with one another. For the last 200 years, most governments of the world have utilized a party system in order to instigate an artificial social divide which is known conventionally as the divide-and-conquer strategy 
strategy of maintaining political power, though more formally it goes by the name of the Hegelian dialectic, even though governments were using forms of this long before Hegel had written about it or was even born for that matter. The political elite need to convince non-state actors that the state fundamentally could and does function with their interests in mind, otherwise the population begins to start trying to undermine the state. Now, this is going to happen regardless of what the state does because it requires exponential growth in order for it to sustain itself, which it can only do by stealing from producers, and since growth for the state necessarily requires resources to be taken away from producers and consumers and thereby reducing the wealth generated which can be produced, well, I'm sure you see the problem here. But what the political elite have found is that their states can spend considerably fewer resources in maintaining themselves if they quell unrest directed at themselves by propagandizing the populations into not being angry with the state when the state merely acts in its own interests and ends up screwing everyone in the process, but instead directing the anger of the general public towards each other by establishing what the state refers to as parties, which in reality are propaganda constructs intended to invent arbitrary categories to have people identify themselves with according mainly to their individual economic interests. Then, whenever the state does something which challenges the interests of a vast swath of the population, or when a politician specifically has the spotlight put on them because they did something which got exposed that enraged people to the point where it would be worse for the state and its controlled media not to address the problem, the state simply blames the politics of one or more of the other political parties, which diverts attention away from the state and towards the people who have certain economic interests that oppose theirs, resulting in most completely forgetting or refusing to acknowledge how this was caused by the existence of the government in the first place. For the longest time, this was a relatively effective political strategy. In fact, it was so effective that governments actually started manufacturing controversies between politicians, such as the whole Russiagate bullshit being the most recent example, to further misdirect people and to make mainstream audiences even more focused on the people whose purported interests are separate from their own, something which wouldn't actually be that big of a deal without a state, and in Instead, people would simply just make mutually beneficial connections to ensure that they had their interests met, producing wealth and at no one else's expense, turned into a conflict where if one group's interests are met, then the other groups necessarily must not be though, in reality, neither of their interests are ever met. But now that people have slowly begun to realize this, the state is attempting to change the focus of this exact same propaganda strategy. Instead of appealing and dividing people into categories based upon individual economic interests, now the political elite are platforming identitarian ideologies in the forms of Marxism, or general belief systems which fall under the umbrella term of what's conventionally known as alt-right, this being done not only to invoke the Hegelian dialectic, but also because identitarianism is fundamentally hostile towards individualist philosophy because identitarians view it as a challenge to their interests making the viewers of mainstream media view the state almost solely as a tool which they use against their political opponents. And by planting controlled opposition personalities in the media, such as Tucker Carlson, who attempts to appeal to the disenfranchised people by producing rants which utilize rhetoric that is superficially similar to the concerns most people have in order to lure in disillusioned members of the population, but then by using misleading euphemisms among various other dishonest debate tactics, trying to convince people that their interests could only be fulfilled by by the state, and that all of their problems are being caused by another political group or politicians who aren't quote-unquote representing them through the government, but that a good government functioning correctly is supposed to function in their interests. 
What makes something a good government, of course, being presented in a manner rhetorically designed to be vague enough to where it can apply to just about any interest, so as many people as possible could identify with it. Anyway, the original poster who first popularized the tactics presented through Beautiful Trouble on Twitter states that, quote, right-wingers don't have a counter to this strategy. And not to get into my issues with the conceptualization of the left-right dichotomy, but this illustrates one of the main benefits the state receives by utilizing Marxist tactics like this. The only way for the tactics of beautiful troubles to be effective are if, one, their opposition isn't unified politically behind one single common view of who their enemy, so to speak, is. Because if there is a diversity of opinion, then there will never be a universal consensus on who's even targeting them in the first place, meaning that it will be impossible for the Marxists to ever be countered. Two. There is a person or group which can be raided or attacked who isn't affiliated with their opposition, has different interests, mostly material, but is required for the Marxists' opposition to host their content, so a centralized platform like YouTube or a political party. The reason why is made obvious in the thread explaining Beautiful Trouble's tactics. And three, their opposition relies on the media or the political system to have their ideas perpetuated. The tactics of beautiful troubles can only be countered with direct action tactics, either based on the polar opposite of every one of the aforementioned points, which since a universal dichotomy and consensus of principle is required as noted in point one, it is impossible for this to be the case, or conforming to every one of the aforementioned points. So basically an anti-Marxist identitarian movement, which is exactly what the state wants and has been platforming through the media. The politicians understand that any and all identitarian movements will not only reject all state skeptical elements or less dogmatic sects of their group since every identitarian movement invariably undergoes a purity spiral, but also will work to achieve the state's end goal of a more polarized social climate. On top of that, it leads people into beginning to look at members of other social groups and who have different material interests than their own as oppressors, and people who hold political power over them, even if they're not state-connected actors. So no matter what happens, in their view, the blame will always be the fault of another social group rather than the state. Now, the good news is that there is a third option here, one which rejects the latter two points entirely, inherently has a unified set of ethical principles which create a political power dichotomy attached to the philosophy, but is anti-state and doesn't succumb to the same internal conflicts with identitarian philosophies. That, of course, is individualist anarchism. And the direct action tactic utilized by individualist anarchists being counter-economics. While both of these concepts have been significantly gaining in popularity over the last few years, ever since 2016, you know, since the last hundred years or so, now is an opportune time more than ever to seek out counter-economic ventures and to make a profit while simultaneously undermining the state and promoting decentralized applications for the same intentions. Because right now, mainstream audiences have identified what Marxists are doing and are kicking themselves trying to figure out how to combat the Marxists without becoming authoritarian collectivists or alienating themselves from the politosphere entirely. Not only can counter-economists and individualist anarchists effectively combat Marxist tactics, but utilizing this strategy is the only way to do so in a manner which undermines the state, social media, and the mainstream media by further decentralizing our means of communication. So while most are probably viewing this realization and turn of events with existential dread over the prospect of identitarianism being positioned by the state to become the new status quo in mainstream politics, 
I'd argue that this is actually just yet another example of the state overlooking really key and important implications of their gay ops and unintentionally sabotaging themselves in the process. Because whether or not a large chunk of people who are active in mainstream politics actually end up becoming ideological identitarians is irrelevant, since this propaganda strategy fundamentally relies on centralized outlets of association, and by making all of these outlets intolerable to use for anyone who is or isn't politically connected, and by weaponizing the spread of information for propagandistic purposes, what the state and the ideologues who who've been suckered in are unwittingly doing is increasing the demand for competitors to come along and specifically for new ways of structure and organization that undermine the current model of centralized proprietary software to come into existence as a direct result of the mainstream media and media outlets beginning to operate directly against the interests of a large majority of the population. A large majority of the population who reject collectivism, only operating around their own material interests, and don't have a high enough value for psychic profit to sacrifice quality in order to affirm their own ideologies. What if you could look up all of those video hosting sites and bypass their algorithms to find the video you're actually looking for, all hosted on your own computer? Imagine not giving your personal information to big corporations or corrupt governments. The only reason totalitarian assholes are able to get videos pulled is because platforms like YouTube are centralized repositories. We can make censorship irrelevant, and we can do it without needing to ask permission from a corporation or beg the priesthood of statism to please, please protect us from the big scary corporations. We can do this, and it's being worked on as we speak, as a component of our Freedom Net project. We'll talk about it more as the project develops. But here's the basic idea. The way we prevent this kind of internet censorship is through decentralized peer-to-peer -peer exchanges. Not only through the internet, but in our day-to-day -day life. As the government continues to expand, increase restrictions, and raise taxes, it will make life more unaffordable for more people. The Trump tax cuts actually cost American taxpayers millions of dollars. To say nothing of how his tariffs have cost Americans $800,000 for every job saved. Gray markets and black markets are swiftly becoming the only way people can afford food and the only way vendors can actually make a profit selling stuff. We can already see this today. A large chunk of Americans don't have more than $1,000 in savings, and 30% of Americans need two jobs just to break even. And these decentralized peer-to-peer -peer exchanges will become the only way for content creators to share their games, their music, their videos, their commentary. This is not only possible with the technology that we have today, but we're already doing it. With peer-to-peer -peer networks, the only way thin-skinned Marxist sociopaths could ever get a video deep platformed is if they get agreement from literally every user. We can innovate censorship out of existence. And the idea that we need the government to solve a problem that was created by the government is simply feeding into the same problem-reaction-solution loop that has gotten us into this mess in the first place. We have the opportunity to defeat socialism and Marxism for all time. All that we need to do is recognize the problem for what it really is. The peril of centralization. So, in conclusion, by creating this atmosphere where there is absolutely no certainty whether or not your account will even exist tomorrow on any centralized proprietary applications, much less be efficient, entertaining for consumers, or profitable for the content creators and the companies which run these sites, the political elite have unwittingly once again made counter-economics the only viable option of simply making ends meet, which even for most 
people who identify with identitarianism is more appealing because unlike the other forms of direct action, agorism appeals to more than just ideology but also to material gains as well. Right now is therefore an opportune time for agorists to make a stand and to demonstrate counter-economics as a means of achieving political change and to possibly even win over countless people in the process. Questions, comments, critique? As I said earlier, share this video around. The more people are aware of counter-economics, the better. What do you think? Leave a comment below. Support me on Patreon. Also, check out Esoteric the Freeze channel, link in the description. Like, share, and subscribe to become a heretic today.